G'day and welcome to uh, another Germany video from Mr. Wimble. Today we'll be looking at, just very quickly, uh, Germany's foundation, i.e. what happened uh, in them becoming a country, and then we'll be looking at, more importantly, what effect that becoming a country had on their national identity, how they see themselves as Germans, what they think Germany represents to them, and who they as a German are. This fine looking chap here is Otto von Bismarck. He is the most important man uh, in history when it comes to the formation of modern day Germany. This here is a map of Germany in the uh, early 1830s, I suppose. Uh, it's straight after the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, so basically what happened with the Napoleonic Wars is Napoleon came in, smashed Switzerland, uh, smashed Austria, went through Russia, uh, Russia, Germany, and Germany basically became kind of like where everyone fought these battles, uh, and he went through here against Russia, lost against Russia, uh, retreated back, etc, etc, etc. The main thing you have to know about all this is uh, Germany went from about 300 odd individual little kingdoms and fiefdoms and states and principalities to 30 odd, I think it's 30 eight or something like that. Okay, so that's the start of when Bismarck starts doing his thing. You've got 38 different states, uh, down from 300. Now, this is the time of great upheaval, and basically, what you've got is two very strong states. You've got Prussia here, all right, and this is actually partly owned here. And you've got Prussia owning a huge chunk of Germany, and you've got Austria down here. And basically, these are the two guys that want to have influence over all the other states. Uh, so we have a process where Bismarck, um, who is the most important kind of figure in Germany, is the Prime Minister. He actually rules. The King is the King, obviously, but the King appoints him, and he runs all the foreign policy. He makes the treaties. He declares war, things like that. Uh, he is very, very important, and what he does is he fights three wars, which basically mean that uh, Prussia here becomes the kind of power in charge of all of Germany. Alright, and we'll see what that looks like. Uh, I'll go through each one step by step. Schleswig-Holstein. Okay, this is just a, a minor kind of conflict compared to the next two. Schleswig-Holstein is a small region to the north of Prussia, uh, and it's uh, kind of a Danish area, and there's a whole lot of uh, fighting and infighting. Um, when the, the king of Denmark dies, uh, you don't have to go into it. Basically what happens is Germany or Prussia, I'll keep saying that, uh, Prussia and Austria actually fight together against Denmark and smash it. Okay, the main reason this is important is it leads to the next conflict. So let's go to the next conflict. Okay, the Austro-Prussian War. This war basically starts because they're still fighting over the Schleswig-Holstein region, uh, which happened, the war happened about five years earlier. They're still fighting over it, and eventually they actually lead to actual fighting. A war between the two hegemonic, the two most important powers in all the kind of German spheres of influence, Austria and Prussia. Okay, uh, here's a map earlier used. There's Schleswig-Holstein, uh, Prussia you already know, and, and, and Austria. Basically what happens is, is a series of battles running up and down here, which Austria wins very handily. Uh, and what happens, which is quite important, is that Prussia does not smash Austria, it doesn't, doesn't have what's called a hard peace, when you really just take everything they've got, okay? They actually opt for a soft piece. This is all Bismarck doing this, a soft piece. And basically what they say is, you can keep your land, you can keep your money, etc, etc. What you need to do is make sure that you stay here and do not actually have an influence on the other small German states. Okay, so, so Prussia basically beats Austria and then says, you've got to guarantee that you're not going to have any kind of say or influence in the other German states to give Prussia a free hand when they actually want to unify all of Germany. 
Okay, so good old Bismarck here is doing quite well for himself. He's managed to, uh, I guess, get Denmark off the page with the whole Schleswig-Holstein thing. Then he's managed to, in a war, uh, keep Austria on side, but make sure that they don't interfere in any of the, uh, the kind of machinations or things that he's going to do in the future. Now, all he's got is all these little states, some of them quite independent, some of them wanting nothing to do with the very kind of authoritarian, militaristic Prussia. So what's he going to do? Well, he's going to go, we all have a common enemy in France. Actually, France included a South Lorraine at the time. France uh, is the enemy, and we are all so much more alike than France. What he did is he managed to basically kind of um, have a huge diplomatic incident by editing a, a text, the Ems Telegram, uh, which basically made it look like Prussia had really, really insulted France. So France declared war on Prussia. Now, France at the time is pretty much the, the strongest continental European force. Okay, Remember, you just had the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, they're quite important. They've got a lot of people. They, they thought they had the most important military. Prussia, however, has been developing a whole lot. Uh, they've become industrialized. They're using artillery a lot more. And basically, uh, in, in a very short period of time, they managed to smash France. Uh, so by 1871, what you have is all these little states asking for protection from Prussia against France. Prussia coming in, smashing France, and then declaring the German Empire. In 1871, we have the birth of modern-day Germany. Uh, Modern-day Germany born through war, through militarism, uh, and in glory, uh, and in kind of like a we-are-the-best-European-country kind of way. Now, this has a big impact when it comes to national identity. Okay, so it's, it's not like Australia's formed as a colony, which very peacefully, kind of, in a long period of time, formed its own national identity. Uh, Germany... Uh, has a national identity kind of thrust upon it. It's it's mainly Prussian, uh, and it's uh, it's forged in war. Okay, I'll show you what I mean. Okay, so you've got this idea of uh, national identity, and basically you've got this graph where you've got French ideals and Prussian now German ideals. Okay, and a lot of these ideals are actually in. Uh, contrast to each other. So, for example, France was known for individualism, whereas Germany was very kind of um, group-like in its structure. So, the family, for example, um, the church, uh, you do what you're told. Okay, so you've got this idea of liberty, individual liberty in France, uh, and authoritarianism. Okay, you will do what you're told. And you'll trust your elders, and you'll trust the people that are in charge, your politicians, you'll trust your parents, you'll trust the church leaders, you'll trust the military leaders, and you'll do what you're told, and everything will work well. Okay, and so what happened, you had all these kind of ideas, you've got, um, I guess you've got this kind of atheism, alright? Not strictly atheism, but basically atheism, as opposed to very strong Protestant ideals over here. Okay, so, so you've got all these kind of ideals... Um, and in the Franco-Prussian War, all right, they came up against each other, and Germany won. So this is this idea that the German slash Prussian ideals are the best ideals. All right, they're the ideals that if we stick with them, we can't go wrong. Until we get to World War One. Now, World War One is is your first real modern war. But people were still thinking of this idea of ideals. So you had France, the old enemy. You had England, who used to be a friend, but is now with the old enemy. And you've got Russia, always an enemy, against Germany and Austria-Hungary, etc., etc. Okay, so you've got these two ideals fighting against each other again. 
Now, this is not actually the case. We know, because we've already looked at this, that really World War I is a war of attrition. It's a war of resources. And once France and England and Russia combine, and the mighty US of A gets involved as well, you know that World War I was always going to be won by this side. Okay, so what happened to their ideals? You can see that over here, Germany is shattered. Alright, they've always seen as themselves, uh, in this kind of national ideal kind of way, as, as triumphant, as glorious, as strong. Do what you're told and it can't go wrong. Your leaders know best, your parents go know best. Except, they did all that and they lost. Their generals were listened to, they were given all the men they were told to, they were, the plans were done to exact kind of formation of what should happen and they lost. So Germany, following the war, Germany in 1918 is a broken country. Alright, not just broke, as in they don't have any money, though they didn't. Not just uh, grieving, because they've lost a whole heap of men, which they did. But actually, their, their ideals and their self-identity is broken. Who are they? They're really looking for, for how are they going to forge ahead in this new world. And so the period that we're going to look at, 1918 through to 1939, you're really going to see this idea of people asking, well, what does it mean to be a German? Okay, we've got the, obviously the political spectrum. Okay, left wing over here, right wing over here. Yeah, you've got uh, kind of conservatism and progress over here. Uh, and you see really a battle going on, okay, between the communists over here uh, so really, there were there were actual fights in the streets following World War One uh, between the left wing communists that wanted Germany to to forge a new way, uh, left uh, progress, a communist state with Russia, uh, and then you had these right wing conservative forces, mainly ex soldiers, okay, the Freikorps they were called, uh, and they were actual um, volunteer kind of paramilitary groups, okay. Uh, huge pitched battles in the streets. Uh, and you've got a legislative battle as well, so you've got parliament, okay, you've got you've got all this happening, and there's a whole lot of upheaval. Okay, and, and into this upheaval we meet this idea that rises up. Not not directly from the Nazis, but the Nazis certainly take it on. And it's a very, very strong idea. Uh, and I'll tell you what it is in two seconds. Now, what if I could tell you, broken German man or woman, that we weren't actually beaten in World War One? See, see, our troops were still fighting. They were still actually on French soil. But our brave, unbroken German soldiers were stabbed in the back. That's right, stabbed in the back. It was the Jew. The November criminals that signed the Versailles Treaty. These Jewish people stabbed our brave soldiers in the backs when they were still fighting. Look at them, the fat cats there, laughing. Clearly a Jewish man stabbing them in the back. How dare they? Now, if this is the case, well, then really, maybe, Germany can go back to the way it was. Maybe maybe Germany can forge, not, not ahead in this new wave of Bolshevism, of communism, maybe it can travel back to the glorious days of 1871. If you do what you're told. Yeah? If you listen to a strong leader, a leader with great ideas, a leader who knows how to get Germany back on track. If you do what you're told, and if you follow, and if you work hard, then really, Germany can get back to its glory days. Germany can once more be a nation people fear. A nation that stands for strength. A nation that stands for unity. A nation the rest of the world doesn't laugh at, but is fearful of. Are you willing to stand up and do what needs to be done? 
Are you willing? Lots of German people were. And we're going to look at the rise of the Nazis from about 1920-ish, about 25 really, till they took power in 1934. This question of national identity is a very big picture because it kind of unites uh, all the events that happened. So we're going to look at that and hopefully understand um, all the other forces involved as well as national identity in the, uh, the rise of Nazism uh, and in kind of the changes to German society from 1918 to 1939. Hope you've enjoyed the video. Hopefully it is uh, informative. Feel free to maybe download it and slow it down if I've spoken too quickly. Uh, see you in class.